thank you so much for this time that you've given to us. And Lord, we just want to pause now and come into your presence and just say thank you so much, Lord, for giving us the privilege of access to your throne. Lord, thank you so much for giving us your son. And Lord, what else could you give greater than that? And Lord, there was nothing else that you could give greater than yourself. And Lord, we just praise you for giving us your all. And Lord, so everything else that we ask for, Lord, is this secondary. It's, it's, it's secondary. It really is, Lord. If you gave us your son, everything else we ask for is secondary. So Lord, we just wanted to say thank you for the privilege. Thank you for the peace. Or thank you for your salvation. Or thank you for the hope and the solid rock hope that we have in you. Thank you for being our eternal rock. And Lord, just thank you so much for your son, Jesus. And Lord, thank you so much for saying that no one took your life, but you willingly laid it down for us. And Lord, we just thank you for the eternal salvation that you give to us. Lord, the privilege to know the one true God and the Son in whom he sent. Lord, we just praise you. Lord, I just lift up this service to you today. I just pray with all my heart that it would be refreshing. Lord, that your word would be magnified, that your son would truly be glorified. And Holy Spirit and God the Father, I just pray that you would be satisfied with every heart in here today. And I just pray that your word would go forth in power. And Lord, that it would just remind, it would refresh, it would convict, it would change, it would challenge us. And Lord, Lord, we're here to be transformed by your word, not just have our heads filled with knowledge. We just ask that your word would transform us by the power of your spirit. And that, Lord, people who have come in here with maybe a little bit of hope will leave with their hope being strengthened even more today, Lord, and more confidence in you and more confidence in your sovereignty and your word. And Lord, we just pray if there's anyone that's lost in this building today, that this would be the day that they would repent of their sin and turn from their ways, their evil ways, and Lord, turn to you. And you tell us in Mark 1, 15, to repent and believe the gospel. And for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and that the wages of sin is death and hell, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And Lord, you tell us that we're saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, least anyone should boast. So Lord, if there's anyone here today that has not repented of their sin in a real way, and have come to you and and have admitted to you that they're a sinner and they're wholly, totally leaning on you, Lord. I pray that this would be the day that they would do that very thing and call upon your name and you tell us in your word, all those that call upon your name, believing in their hearts you were raised from the dead, shall be saved. So, Father, we just ask that you would do that very thing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, guys. Well, I kind of told you last Wednesday we just kind of want to maybe just kind of just do a quiz and we just kind of want to just get just some just you know basic handles on on the timeline of prophecy and how that works and uh and there's different subjects that we can talk about different areas i'm going to quiz you on some of these things we've already discussed so some of these things you should know and if you don't know that's okay that's why we're going over there them again to have it wash over us because there's a lot to learn about prophecy especially when it comes to the timeline and and how all that works and what's next and and what's coming down the pike but as i've already said a preacher can now stand in a pulpit and clearly, with that with confidence, say that every single prophetic piece is on the chessboard and that there's not one in the drawer. Some are being moved, some are about to be moved, but they're all on the chessboard ready to be played, ready to be moved. Uh, the seeds are being sown already. You can see Ezekiel 38 and 39, Ezekiel's war, and this is what this is a picture of. And, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that just for a refresher. But Ezekiel 38 and 39, this is the Gog and Magog War. Who can tell me what Gog means? What's that? No, not, it doesn't mean Russia. What does Gog mean? This is why, this is why we're going, this is why we're being refreshed, amen? All right. No, it's not Germany. Gog, Gog means prince or ruler, like Pharaoh, like, like, a, like a title, Gog, right? Mag, Magog, though, we do know is Russia. And if you go to Genesis chapter 10, if you look at Noah and his sons, you'll see that one of his sons, Noah's grandsons, was Magog, and they settled in the north. And they became ultimately what was known as the Scythians, and they were fierce uh, warriors. They were known for riding horses. They were able to uh, ride a horse and turn around on it and shoot a bow and arrow and kill their enemy. That's how good they were, but they were known for that. But Magog, we know, is in the north, and we know that that's talking about Russia. And so the Word of God teaches us that one day the prince or the ruler of Russia is going to turn on Israel and be aligned with all these other, uh, all these other uh, countries that you see up here. And we'll talk more about what those countries are. But all of 
these prophetic pieces are on the board and there's a lot of intricate pieces small pieces but they're all on the on the chessboard when it comes to prophecy so let me ask you this what would be the next great event on god's prophetic calendar what are we waiting for the rapture right everything's in place no signs have to be fulfilled in order for the next great event to happen and that's the rapture of the church boy think about that man the rapture i don't know about you but man that's an exciting thought to me you know really for those of us that are saved those of us that are christians it's 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 the brightest day in our future is it not amen boy it's the brightest day in our future but to those that are lost it's a what it's a threat and when god makes a threat or a warning he follows up with that threat does he not boy he sure does but it's a warning hey turn around pay attention repent give your heart to me and i believe with all my heart man time is definitely short so if you have your Bible, go, go to Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. And let's look down there at uh, verse 8 Luke 21 verse 8 and let's see what God's word says to us Luke 21 8 it says take heed that you be not deceived for many shall come in my name saying I am Christ and the time draweth near go ye not therefore after them all right so the question is and this is a simple easy we're starting easy all right why why shouldn't we go after somebody that says Hey, I'm Christ. Come and follow me. If somebody were to come to you on this planet right now and say, Hey, man, I want you to know I'm Christ, and I want you to come and follow me. Why, should, why, why shouldn't you go? Because he's what? He's already come. That's one thing. All right. Why, what, what's another reason why you shouldn't go? What's that? Exactly. He won't have to tell us who he is. We'll know. Because the Bible says every eye will what? See him when he comes back. And they'll know whom they pierce, the Bible says. So they're going to know. Absolutely. All right. What's another reason why you shouldn't follow him? Yes. Exactly. That's the answer I'm looking for. Because Christ is coming back what? In the air. He's coming back in the clouds. He's not on planet earth. So we don't have to look horizontally for Christ. We're looking vertically for Christ. Amen. So that's huge. It's simple, but boy, it's huge. All right, let's keep reading. And then it says this. It says, uh, but when you shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by yet. But as Matthew says, these are the beginnings of what? What does Matthew compare these these troubled times to? Birth pains. And what what's what's so special about birth pains or what why would he compare what's going on to birth pains yeah it gets worse and worse so contractions for a baby get worse and worse the pain gets worse and worse as the baby draws near right well as as the tribulation baby is about is about the it's, it's, it's being given birth it's moving it's it's coming and tr the tribulation is coming boy it really is and you can see where uh it's topsy-turvy like for example israel uh, this, these are things that you don't hear. And this is why we have those sheets in the back for conservative news outlets that what's really going on in Israel, American relations and different things like that. You're not going to hear on Fox or any of these other news stations. But Syria, uh, looking at this map, we know is up north of Israel. All right. So who, who's occupying Syria right now? This is a major. Ch these are chess pieces now. All right. You got what they call the ring of fire around Israel. All those, all those uh, proxy groups of Iran, and Iran is fueling all of these, all of these groups that surround the whole entire border of Israel, and it's known as the Ring of Fire. That's what people like to call it. Now, when we first started learning about prophecy, the first problematic people were the uh, the Palestinian Jihad, and they were the first ones to catch that ring on fire. Well, as, as things are going now, the Hezbollah is involved, and Israel had just sent drones over to 
um, Palestine or the West Bank or what we would call biblically Samaria and Judea for the first time in 17 years used drones to bomb because I think four of four Israelite soldiers were killed and so that was their that was their attack back but so there's trouble everywhere and then in Syria right now the looking at Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39 boy this was given the prophecy given how many years ago God when was Ezekiel written how many years ago about 2600 years ago right and man and the biggest two players in that book are what what two countries are the biggest players in Ezekiel 38 and 39 that war that's coming Israel okay that's one okay Russia's another one who else who's the other major player Iran Iran Persia now it was Persia up until 1935 it became Iran after that but Iran is a major major player in Russia well guess who is guess who is joining forces right now guess who are allies and partners right now Russia and Iran boy so the seeds of Ezekiel 20 38 and 39 are already being sown boy they are now in Syria the problem is you have Russia occupying Syria well you got Hezbollah you got this Palestinian jihad and all these other groups up there that uh Iran is using to fuel all these proxies around Israel, the Ring of Fire, but also uh, Syria is a, a, a great way to take, take from Iran, going through Iraq, or coming around Iraq through Syria, moving all their missiles, all of those things. So that creates a problem. Why? Because Ukraine has now just accused Israel of saying that they're basically uh, partnering up with Russia and that they're pro-Russia, and yet Israel has given Ukraine $22 million in aid, humanitarian aid. Uh, they were talking about giving them uh, the Iron Dome defense that they have in Israel themselves. The Iron Dome is a missile system that Israel has that surrounds the whole country of Israel. So any missiles that are shot into Israel, they're shot down by what they call the Iron Dome. Uh, when those 1,200 missiles that were just recently shot over there, it had a 91% percent accuracy rate of knocking those things down well they were thinking about giving ukraine one of those things but the problem is is that if it falls into the wrong hands like if russia gets that they could use that against against us and against everybody else so israel's in a very precarious situation right now anytime they meet with ukraine ukraine's accusing them now of being pro-russia and every time israel meets with russia it takes off ukraine so they're in a situation where they can't win so, Ben, boy, things are heating up. Things are hot over there. Things are volatile. And these are all the chess pieces that, man, Ezekiel, man, talks about. You got Turkey faltering. You got uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, the same day they let Israel in, they also opened up the embassy for Iran. So you got all kinds of politically things going on. And praise God, he's in charge of all that. Amen. But I'm saying all these things and sharing all these things because there are wars and rumors of wars, and we're going to continue to hear about wars and more and more rumors of wars at a more frequent level as we already have. Are you with me? So you can see, man, the Bible is alive and well. It's living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword as the Word of God teaches us. Amen? And that right there should strengthen you. This right here should just give you hope. Like, hey, man, you know, because, guys, listen, what people, what Christians forget is that most pagans, when they hear about the Bible, someone that wasn't raised in church at all, when, they, when, you, when you say, hey, well, the Word of God says, well, the Bible says, well, we're, we're very familiar with those terminology, but someone that's lost, you got to remember, they're looking at the Bible like you would a surgeon that came out of his office with a 2,500-year-old surgeon book and said, hey, I'm going to do some operating on you today with this book. That'll make you feel good, right? You're going to operate on me with a, a book that's 2,500 years old? I don't think so. Amen? Well, that's exactly how they look at the Bible, a lot of people. An old, ancient, archaic book that some man wrote somewhere. Well, I've heard that even from my own family members. Eh, it's just a book some man wrote. Boy. And that's the mindset. But if you look at what's going on and you look at, man, how accurate it is, man, I tell you what, son, it'll give you hope. It'll put a spring in your step. And I'm telling you, with all my heart, I believe Jesus is coming soon. Why do I say that? Because Jesus himself tells us that. Let's keep reading. Notice what it says bring this up a little bit higher for me all right it says uh verse 10 then said he unto them nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and great earthquakes shall be in diverse places and famines and pestilence and fearful sights and great signs 
shall there be from heaven well we know that right now there's pestilence there's different famines we know that there's different earthquakes in diverse places we saw the one that just happened in turkey what about six months ago or whenever that was it made that it literally made a new valley if you were able to see that on the news have you if you haven't had a chance to look up that earthquake in turkey look at the valley that it made in a matter of seconds boy you know geologists and all these other people would come and say oh this valley took millions and millions of years look at look at all the different layers of dirt look at all the different layers of time and yet man it happened in seconds boy it swallowed up i forgot how many olive trees but man i think it was you could put the uh you could put the um statue of liberty in it that's how deep it was and it went for miles wow and then you think about man the earthquake that's coming to this planet the Bible says, man, that man, all the mountains are going to be removed. All the cities are going to topple. And then man, Jeremiah and Isaiah says, man, the earth like, reels like a drunkard, like a drunkard to and fro, that the earthquake is so big. All the islands are going to disappear. Every mountain is going to be swallowed up and will not be seen. You can read that in Revelation chapter 16. Read it in the Greek. So I mean, I'm telling you, man, people don't have a clue what's coming, but it's coming. And you think about God has been holding back his wrath for how long now? boy for a long time the bible says in romans chapter one that people store up wrath unto themselves he even says that the queen of sheba will rise up in this generation and judge remember how she said she'll rise up in this generation and condemn you and and your condemnation is going to be greater than theirs why because they had one greater than jonah remember that so the word of god talks about people storing up wrath so you figure for two thousand years man god's let people mock him take his name in vain all of these things and i'm telling you when the tribulation comes they're going to see a side of god that you don't want to see and it's going to wake this world up in fact this ezekiel war ezekiel 38 and 39 is so significant you, rather than me telling you why it's so significant what's the most what's the most significant thing about the ezekiel 38 and 39 war when it comes to prophecy It's a prelude to Armageddon. That's good. I didn't think about it that way, but that's good. What else? Why is it so important? What's going to happen to Israel when this takes place? When God, you see, during this fight, during this battle, God's not going to, or Israel's not going to lift a finger. God's doing all the fighting. He's going to do the whole battle for them. And it says that the whole world is going to be put on notice that the God of Israel is truly alive and well. Amen? But there's something more significant than that. What, and that's what I'm asking. What's, what's more significant than that? The whole world is going to be put on notice that God is alive and well. But who else is going to be put on notice? Who? Well, Satan. And he knows that God's alive and well already. Amen? He, he's, he's well, very well aware that God's alive and well. But the Bible says that Israel, when God brought them back after he scattered them to all the different nations for their punishment, when he brought them back, they would come back in unbelief. Well, most people don't know that Israel right now, a lot of them are atheists. And the majority of Israel are atheists. And the Word of God tells us in Ezekiel 38 and 39 that when he does what he's going to do to all of these people, groups, that Israel is going to know that God is real and that he is the God of Israel and that he is Israel's protector. And they're going to know it from that day forward, the Bible says. So that's why this event is so, so uh, important and this event, you, I mean, before I couldn't talk about these chess pieces, but now I can. Israel and Iran and Turkey, uh, Northern Africa, you got Afghanistan and all the other uh, uh, stands that are out there, that whole part, Russia. So you got North Africa, you got Russia, you got Iran, the Iraqish area, you got all these proxies that surround Israel, the Ring of Fire. You have Turkey, you've got uh, North Africa, and then you've got parts of uh, below, below uh, Egypt down there. So you have all these people groups coming against Israel. Now here's the quiz. I've said this three times. How big is Israel? What state do you compare it to? New Jersey, new Jersey right? So it's about the size of New Jersey, right? So if you want to get an idea of how big the Ezekiel 38-39 war is as a matter of a refresher... You have to look at look at the ten states that surround New Jersey, right? The ten states that surround New Jersey. Let's 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 call that the Ring of Fire. The ten states are these ten people groups that surround Israel. Psalm eighty three talks about these ten people groups. 
this ring of fire. Well, think about the 10 states that surround New Jersey, and all those states hate New Jersey and want everybody in New Jersey did, and they want New Jersey wiped off the map. That would be difficult to have 10 states against you already, right? But in comparison to Russia and Turkey and North Africa and uh, Iran and Afghanistan and Pakistan and all those stands that go back that way, it's comparable to all 50 of the United States, Canada, all the way up to Alaska, all the way down to Central America, all the way down to South America, having all of those countries and states be against New Jersey. That's who's coming against Israel. That's a good comparison, but Russia is a whole lot bigger. So the people groups that are coming against Israel are, would be much bigger than the people groups that would come against New Jersey, but that's a good comparison to how this war is going to be. And the Bible tells us in Zechariah that, man, God's going to allow Israel to be a heavy stone around the neck of the world, and it's going to burden the world. And the Bible says that every nation is going to hate Israel, and every nation is going to come to the battle of Armageddon. So the seeds of Armageddon are being sown. I believe personally, now this is my personal belief, my personal opinion, not to say the Lord, I'm stepping out of the pulpit, but I, think, I personally think that the Antichrist is breathing air today. I think he's alive and well today. It's just a matter of when he reveals himself, but he can't reveal himself until what happens. What's that? The Holy Spirit has to be pulled back, and what else has to be taken? One other thing has to happen before he can be revealed. What's that? The church has to be removed, right? Because we're the salt and the light, right? That holds back evil. We're the, we're the uh, conduit, if you will, that the Holy Spirit uses to hold back evil. So with the church gone and the Holy Spirit pulling back his power, man, that's going to allow the Antichrist to rise. And when the Antichrist does rise, where's he going to show himself? In the temple. And what's he going to do when he gets in the temple? He's going to declare himself God, and he's going to tell the whole world that he wants to be worshipped above all that is called God. Boy, and that's going to be where the deception comes in, the big lie. So let me give you a, uh, another quiz before we, we jump into this. What's going to happen to people that miss the rapture? Truly, what's going to happen? I'll tell you what, go to Second Thessalonians in your Bible, Second Thessalonians, and read right now, read verses 1 through 12 to yourself. Second Thessalonians and read verses 1 through 12 to, to yourself, if you're able to. And if you can't, then have somebody read it for you uh, next to you in the pew. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And as you're reading, I want you to look for four things that are going to happen to people that miss the rapture. I'll give you a clue. The rapture takes place in verse 1. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 is a chapter that we're looking into the future, our future. It's a prophetic chapter, and it's looking at a group of people that missed the rapture because they didn't repent of their sin, and the Bible says they took pleasure in unrighteousness, and as a result of that, the Bible says that God's going to send those people that didn't believe the gospel, they didn't repent, he's going to send those people that rejected the gospel for the last time a strong delusion that they must believe the lie. And the lie is that the Antichrist is God. They're going to believe, so if they reject Jesus Christ, they've had a chance to hear the gospel, repent, and they say no, and Jesus comes back in the rapture, all those people will receive Antichrist because the Bible says that God will send them strong delusion. You'll see that. So look for four things that are going to take place, actually take place with people that miss the rapture. So take a moment and read that and, and try to figure out the four things that are going to happen, actually happen to people that miss the rapture. things that are going to happen to people that miss the rapture. You guys done reading or do you need a little bit more time?
Does anybody want to take a gander at the four things that are going to happen to people that miss the rapture from 2 Thessalonians verses 1 through 12? What's that? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That they all might be damned who believe not in the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. And if you look at verse 10, it says, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Why were they perishing? Why did they go to hell? Because they, this group of people, Receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Well, what's the one truth that saves people? Well, what do we call that truth? The gospel, right? What did Paul say about the gospel in Romans 1 16? For it is the power of God unto salvation, right? It's the power of God. The gospel is the power of God. So these people clearly heard the truth, had a chance to repent, had a chance to respond to the Lord, and they said no. And as a result of that, this group of people... Because they said no, what does it say? And for this cause, because they didn't repent and believe the gospel, God shall send them what? That they should believe what? The lie. Boy, did you hear that? So they, they, this, this group of people send their day of grace away. So looking at chapter 2, show me the four things that are going to happen to people that miss the rapture. Do you see it in there? Can you find four things in there that are going to happen to people that miss the rapture? This will give you an idea of what a preacher goes through. Well, they're looking at that pastor, looking at that scripture, looking at it, you know, trying to, trying to. <laughs> What's that? Well, that was one. That's one thing. All right, so that means what? People are going to be what? during People that missed the rapture, who heard the gospel, had a chance to repent, the first thing that you pointed out is, number one, they're going to be what? Deceived. They're going to be duped. They're going to reject Jesus Christ, and the Bible says that they're going to receive the Antichrist because they must believe the lie. And we know what that lie is, the Antichrist claiming himself to be God and showing himself to be God. That's the lie. All right, so what else? If you look at verse 1 of chapter 2, we can find another thing that's going to happen to people that miss the rapture, and this is why we don't want to miss this rapture. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering un together unto him. Now go in your Bible to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and look at verse, I believe it's number 16. The Bible says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then which we are alive and remain shall be caught up. You see that? Caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air so shall we ever be with the Lord wherefore comfort one another with these words so if you go back to chapter 2 now and you'll look at verse number 1 you can see what that we beseech you by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ what coming is he talking about he's talking about 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 16 when the Lord comes back to get his people the church in the rapture all right so in chapter 2 it's a prophetic look into the future and he's showing us past our future and he's zooming in like a telescope on this group of people that reject jesus christ as their lord and savior who's going to receive the antichrist so in verse one the rapture takes place boom by our gathering together unto him and then he goes on and he says to this group of people don't be don't 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 be soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us that the day of Christ is at hand. Notice what he says there, that the day of Christ is at hand. Did you notice he didn't say that the day of Lord, the day of the Lord is at hand? He says that the day of Christ is at hand. Now, what's the difference between the day of the Lord and the day of Christ? Big difference now. Now, remember, this group of people, these Thessalonians were young Christians. He was there for three weeks. A lot of them got born again. And then Paul got run out of town on a rail. He got, he got persecuted, got run out of town. Well, somebody came in, forged a letter, and said, Hey, man, you guys missed the rapture. You're in the day of the Lord. And Paul said, Hey, don't let anyone deceive you. There are certain things that have to take place in order for Christ to physically put his feet on the Mount of Olives. See, people get the rapture and the second return of Christ confused all the time. The rapture of the church 
is the beginning of what's known theologically as the second coming of Christ. That's where people get confused. The second coming of Christ is not just one event. The second coming of Christ is a series of events that are linked together. And the first part of that event, link A, is the rapture. Link B is the seven-year tribulation. And link C is when we come back with the Lord, his holy angels, to the battle of Armageddon, where he's going to defeat the false prophet, the beast, put them into the lake of fire, Satan's bound for a thousand years, and then we go into what's known as the millennial reign. So during that time, this is the this is the timeline that we're looking at. So the Bible tells us right here in verse one that if you miss the rapture, you're gonna be what? Deserted. You're gonna be deserted by who? By everyone that was truly born again, that really knew the Lord Jesus Christ. And that desertion will be permanent. It will be eternal desertion. If people miss the rapture, why? Because it says right there, down there in verse 11, 10, 11, and 12, that these people rejected the gospel and a strong delusion was sent to them by God himself that they are going to believe the Antichrist. Boy. So they're going to be deserted. And then the Bible says what? Our dear brother back there already pointed it out. Let no man deceive you by any means. Do you see that? That the day of Christ, that, that that day shall not come and kept, come a falling away first, that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember, when I was with you, I told you these things. So the very the, the very encouraging thing to me is that the very fact that these Thessalonians, these Thessalonians are upset. Why are they upset? Because somebody told them that they missed the rapture and that they were in the day of the Lord. Now, during this time, if you read 1 Thessalonians, there was persecution going on. So these young Christians believed that maybe they were in the tribulation because they were young and they were messed up. So Paul takes out his pen in 2 Thessalonians and writes and corrects the time of the coming of Christ and says, listen, don't get the rapture confused with the second coming when he puts his feet on the Mount of Olives. Are you with me? All right? Yes. Yes, and that's where I was getting back to. So the day of Christ, notice it says the day of Christ. Philippians 1, 6 says, He who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of what? The day of the Lord or until the day of Jesus Christ. So there's the day of Christ. Well, the day of Christ is the rapture event for us. That's the day of Christ. You're being perfected and will be continue to be made into the image of Christ, the Bible says, until the day of Christ, until Christ comes back and gets you and perfects you where you receive your new body. Amen? So that's the day of Christ. But the day of the Lord starts as soon as we're raptured and we're taken off this planet, the day of the Lord starts on planet Earth. And the day of the Lord is the beginning of the tribulation when the Antichrist signs the peace treaty. And the day of the Lord involves wrath, but it also involves peace. So if you read in Isaiah, when Jesus came into the temple and he read Isaiah, and he said that this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing as I've just read it today, he stopped short. And when you read where he stopped short, if you keep reading what he said, it talks about the wrath of God, the day of the Lord. So he paused just before he talked about that part. So the day of the Lord goes from the time that the Antichrist signs the peace treaty, that's the seven-year tribulation, and it goes all the way to the end of the millennial reign. So the day of the Lord involves wrath, but it also involves that 1,000-year reign of peace. That's the day of the Lord. But the day of Christ is when he's going to come. And right now we're living in the day of Christ, if you will. And we're waiting for him to come. And this culmination of this day is when he takes us off this planet. So if he's taking us off the planet, that means that those are going to be left behind. That's why you hear those movies entitled Left Behind. Why? Because they're eternally going to be left behind. Then the Word of God says God's going to send strong delusion, so they're, 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 they're deserted eternally. They're deceived eternally because they're going to be duped because they, re they didn't repent and they didn't want the truth and they took pleasure in unrighteousness, so they're going to be duped. But what's the third thing that's going to happen? Now, when you read about this, it says right there that when Satan comes, what's he going to do? Verse 8, and the wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. 
even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Deceptive signs, if you will. Uh, some of them are not going to be true miracles, if you will, at all. So he's coming. So that talks about the tribulation period, right? A great falling away. All of these things, the sun and the moon are going to be darkened. So he's talking about the tribulation period. So the third thing that's going to happen to people, they will be destroyed. And they're going to be destroyed, the Word of God says. And I don't have time, but if you read Revelation chapter 6, Revelation chapter 9, Revelation chapter 14, 19, and 16, man, you'll see the bowl judgments, the trumpet judgments, the, the uh, bile judgments, all those judgments that are coming on this planet. And you remember we talked about just one of the judgments was those hailstones. They say right now in the Guinness Book of World Records, the, the biggest hailstone ever recorded to date was like a pound and a half. Those hailstones, according to Revelation chapter 16, are going to be 90 pounds. And you remember what I said, those scientists did those studies. And a 30-inch diameter ice ball weighs 90 pounds. And they say that, you know, terminal velocity, I, don't quote me on this, guys, I'm not a scientist, but I think it's around approximately 278 miles an hour that these balls are going to reach. And they did a, another study on if you get hit by one. Well, the equivalent to getting hit by one is you taking your foot and stepping on a great part as you can. Boy. That's why the Bible says that it was an exceedingly great, exceedingly great hailstone. So that's just one, one, one event that's going to be a, a series of a hundred events that are taking place on this planet. Now, that's not counting all the sea life dying, all the ocean being turned to blood, Man, the river's being turned to blood, like it says in Revelation. Read it, man, an earthquake so great. And then the Bible says it was not, not just a great earthquake, but, but so great an earthquake that none has ever happened since man has been, been on the face of the earth. Boy, I'm telling you what. It's coming. So they'll be destroyed. If you miss the rapture, you'll be, you'll be deserted eternally. You'll be deceived eternally you'll be destroyed. And if you make it through all of that, if you make it through all of that, what does Revelation chapter 14 say? Those that receive the mark on their right hand or their forehead, what does it say? They shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God that's poured into the cup without measure. Boy, you think about God's infinite wrath, that's why hell is forever, because his wrath is infinite. Boy, poured out without measure. And it says that there's no rest day or night for them and the smoke of their torment goes up day and night, and there's no rest. And they burn in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. Wow. Man, you'll be damned forever. Those are the four Ds that people look forward to if they miss the rapture. That's why it's so important to know the gospel. Man, share the gospel. Preach the gospel. Go to a church that's all about preaching the gospel. Constantly ringing that bell. Amen? Why? Because hell is forever. And that's where this world is going. In fact, Proverbs even says, every nation that forgets God, God will turn into hell. Boy, and we're in a country right now that is vastly and greatly forgetting God. Boy. So those are the four things the Word of God tells us are going to happen to people. Man, they're going to be, they're going to be deserted. They're going to be deceived. They'll be destroyed. And if they make it through all that, ultimately the Bible says the angels come, bound them up, and cast them into hell if they don't know the Lord. And they have that mark of the beast on their right hand or their forehead. And then the Bible says that those that get the mark on their right, right hand or their forehead, his name, his mark, or number, that will receive a grievous uh, malignant sore, also, the Bible says. So, man, guys, this, this is just getting started. This is just the tip of the iceberg of what people are going to go through. So going back to Ezekiel 38 and 39. Go in your Bible to Ezekiel 38 and 39 really quick. Ezekiel 38 and 39. Let me show you something about how these, these pieces are lining up. So the next great event on God's calendar we, we talked about is the rapture of the church. All signs have been fulfilled. The temple right now, they've got the menorah, that golden candlestick. They got that on display. They say they got the red heifer ashes. Everything's in place for them to build it. But now the powder keg in Israel is the temple mount. That's, if you want to look at a powder keg with a big fuse, boy, that would be it right there. You got... The Palestinians saying that, yeah, Jews can come up to the top of it, but they can't pray. Now think about what that means to a Jew. Man, we, we've been here for over 3,000 years, man. Kings of Israel, David, Solomon, 
Uh, Christ himself even taught at the Temple Mount. What are you talking about? We can't pray here. Boy, so that you can see the tension. Well, then you got Christians laying stake to Abraham because we're, we're you know, through Christ, Abraham, uh, all the nations would be blessed, and we put our faith in Christ as a result of that. But we lay, we lay uh, stake to that because Christ is our Lord and Savior. So you got Christians that want to be on the Temple Mount, but they're not allowed to pray. Jews are not allowed to pray. Only Muslims are allowed to pray. So you can see the tension, and you can see where animosity and Satan gets in there and starts stirring up hate and all this other kind of junk. And then you got all these countries surrounding Israel right now. Everything they do, they're going to take off one group of people and, and please another group. They can't win either way they're going. So, guys, I'm telling you, things are really, truly heating up over there. So let's read Ezekiel 38 and 39 really quick because I think this is going to take place before the rapture. I personally believe this is going to take place before this, this war. So, I mean, I'm watching, we're looking. But let's, let's read what it says. It says, And the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, set thy face against Gog. Now, you remember, that's a term for the king or the prince of Russia, if you will. It's a, it's a title, like Pharaoh. All right, Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech, Tubal, and prophesy against him. Now, you think about Ezekiel when he was prophesying against these nations. I mean, Ezekiel probably hadn't even been out of Israel. He has no clue where half of these nations are that he's talking about. This is what God's word is so amazing. Amen? So these seeds are now, they were planted here in Ezekiel, but now, man, you're beginning to see this tree come up out of the ground of all that's going to take place in Ezekiel 38 and 39, if you will. All right, so let's keep reading. Then it says, and thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I'm against thee, O Gog, chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. I will turn thee back and put hooks in thy jaw, and I will bring thee forth in all thine army and horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, of all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, Libya with them, all of them with shields and helmets, Gomer and all his bands, the house of Togermah of the north quarter, and all his bands, and many people with thee. Be thou prepared, and prepare thyself, thou, and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. Let's pause right there. So we just got done reading a bunch of old biblical names. We got Put, Ethiopia, you have uh, Meshach, Togamal. Well, you can see where all, all of these point to. Uh, Gomer and Tubal is around the Turkey area. Togamal, Meshach, is north of Israel. You got Magog, you got Rosh, you got uh, Kakistan, Afghanistan, all those areas over there it's dealing with. Then you have Persia, which is Iran, uh, and Russia. Those are the two major players that, we, or that you just read about in th these verses. And these two are in coalition with one another. And the problem with Syria is Russia occupies Syria. And that's where a lot of Israel's enemies are at right now, is in Syria. So the problem is, the reason why you see uh, the prime minister or the president of Israel talking to Putin all the time is to man, say, hey, look, we got enemies from Iran in Syria that want to attack our border, and we need to fly over there, and we want to make sure that when we fly and bomb these people that, you know, we, we're still at peace with Russia. So they, get, they got to check with Russia so they don't hit anything Russia, because if they hit anything Russia, all it's going to do is cause a war with what? Russia. So they got to be really careful what they do, boy. So you talk about walking on eggshells right now. This is, where, this is where Israel's at, boy. So pray for Israel. They need God's wisdom, amen? Boy, they do. So, man, I tell you what, man, you can just see, boy, as we, as we keep reading, you're going to see the blood being pumped into these chess pieces. You're going to see how God is already moving some of these prophetic chess pieces on the table right now. Let's keep reading. Then it says... Uh, in verse number 8. And after many days thou shalt be visited. All right? After many days thou shalt be visited. In the latter years thou shalt come back into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel that have been carried away. Boy. So there's another prophetic statement. Do you see it? He's saying, hey, remember how I scattered you? But there's going to come a day where I'm going to bring you back after many days. All right? Well, when... When is after the sword talking about? That scripture that talks about the sword, what is that sword talking about right there? Who can tell me?
After many days thou shalt be visited, and the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword, and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been always a waste, but is brought forth out of a nation, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. All right, so what is that sword talking about? This nation will be brought back after the sword, right? That's talking about like when Titus came in with, with uh, his invasion and, and scattered Israel. Remember that? And how he destroyed the temple, all those things. He uh, enslaved, uh, I think, uh, 1,300,000 people lost their lives, and then a, a big group of them also got carted off to the rest of the nations. Well, it says, after many days, Israel has to become a nation again, right? Well, we know that happened in May of 1948, right? So we know this is what he's talking about. He's talking about our days. He's talking about when Israel became a nation again. So he's leaping into the future here in Ezekiel chapter 38. Then he says this, and, and then it says, they shall dwell safely, all of them. Well, right now, man, Israel is, for the most part, even though they got all this chaos going on, but for the most part, they are dwelling safely. You know, they're, they're, they're not being uh, completely overrun by any country right now. Also, Israel, it says, notice, that, notice it says that it was a waste place. It says, um, um, verse 8, After many days thou shalt be visited in the latter years. Thou shalt come back into a land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which has always been a waste. Do you see that? There was a guy that went through Israel in the 1850s, a, a writer, and he said, man, what, what a barren wasteland Israel is. It's just a wasteland of this barrenness. If you go there now, and now it's lush. It's green. It's a land that is flowing with milk and honey. You've heard me say, and, they, and you can research it, but Israel has planted over 250 million trees in Israel. If you look around the Sea of Galilee, man, it's lush. It's beautiful. So, man, I'm telling you, everything is on the table. All of these prophecies had to be true because Israel is not only had to become a nation, but it had to be a nation that was no longer a, a place that was a place of waste or looked at as being desolate or deserted. It's no longer that. So we know that these prophecies are now true and are on the table. All right, let's keep reading. Then it says, Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm taking about all these, these people groups that are going to march against Israel. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land, all thy band and many people with thee. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall come to pass that at the same time shall things come into thy mind, and thou shalt think an evil thought. And thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages, and I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates, to take the spoil and to take a prey, to turn thy hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited, and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations, which have gotten cattle, goods that dwell in the midst of the land, Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish, with all the young lions thereof, shall say unto thee, Art thou come to take the spoil? Thou hast gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take great spoil? Now, notice it says Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish, these young lions, if you will. They're going to look and say, wow, have you guys come to invade? Uh, have you guys come to invade to take all the spoils from Israel? Now, who is that people group? Well, Sheba and Dedan in Ezekiel 38 verse 19 is talking about Saudi Arabia right here. So Saudi Arabia is going like, to seem to be neutral during this time, and they're going to be like, what are you guys doing? Now, some people think the young lions in that verse is a reference to either England or America. The young lions. The world's going to be watching. Like, hey, what are you guys doing with Israel? Have you come to take the spoils? This is what it's talking about. But, but Sheba and Dedan is right here in the Saudi Arabia area. So they're going to be watching it from a distance, the word of God says. Then it says this in verse 14. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog, that's the ruler of Russia, Thus saith the Lord God, In that day when my people of Israel dwell safely, shall thou not know it? And shall thou come from the, the, thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee? All these other people groups we talked about on this map. All of them riding upon horses, a great company, and a mighty army. Now, people get hung up with, well, you know, we, we don't have horses today. Day. Well, we do have horses, but we're, 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 the military doesn't use horses like they did back in the day when they had the cavalry. Well, you got to remember, Ezekiel is seeing a vision of, of the future, man, thousands of years into the future, 
and he has nothing to compare tanks or whatever he's seeing to. So what do you do when you see something that's unknown or weird to you? You try to find something that you are used to that you can somehow com compare it to. And so I think this is what Ezekiel himself is doing. He's trying to take this massive vision that God's giving him, and he's trying to relate something that he knows that he can relate to it. So I don't have a problem when it says horses and all that because it's talking about this war that's coming. All right, let's keep reading. And then it says... Uh, verse 15, thou shalt come from the place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company and mighty army. And thou shalt come up against the people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days, and I will bring thee against my land. All right, so this is Russia, Persia, or Iran, um, Turkey, North Africa, uh, Afghanistan, all the Kakistan, the uh, part up north, all of these people coming to march on Israel. And I will bring thee against my land, that the heathen may know me when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. So what is God doing? One of his purposes is saying, hey, listen, I'm going to be sanctified. I'm going to be glorified. And the world's going to be put on notice that I, God, am the ruler of the universe. Amen? All right, let's keep reading. Then it says this, verse 16, or uh, I'm sorry. Uh, verse 17, thus saith the Lord God, art thou a he of whom I have spoken in old time by my servants, the prophets of Israel, which prophesied in those days many years that I would bring thee against them? So he's saying, hey, listen, man, this prophecy against you is coming from old. Boy, look at verse 18. And it shall come to pass at the same time when Gog, the ruler of Russia, shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come upon, uh, should, my fury shall come up in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath, I have spoken. Now, what does the Bible say about God's wrath, the fire of his God's wrath? One, it says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Amen? And number two, what does the Bible say? That when God showed up to Mount Sinai, what did the mountain do? It quaked, and what else? Man, it burned with fire. Boy, our, the Bible says our God is a consuming fire. So let's just not read over these things, but man, he's coming in judgment. Notice what it says. For in my jealousy and my fire of my wrath I have spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. So God's going to send an earthquake to help Israel fight this battle. That's one thing that's going to happen. Then he says, so that the fishes of the sea and the fowl of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all the creeping things that creep upon the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence and the mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall and every wall shall fall to the ground. And I will call a sword against him throughout all my mountains says the lord god every man's sword shall be against his brother so god's going to also not only send an earthquake but he's going to send confusion to these people and they're going to turn on one another now has that happened in history before has god done something like that before remember the medians how he, he he brought confusion to the camp and they turned on one another and killed one another well he's going to do the same thing here in our near future when this war takes place now notice what it says Verse 22, and I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood, and I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon many people that are with him, overflowing rain, torrential rain, great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Boy. Now, science had went to Sodom and Gomorrah, and, and they really believe they have actually found where Sodom and Gomorrah was. And if you look at the ground of, of this place, Man, it, it looks like it was just all melted with this like intense heat. It's incredible to look at. Uh, when we get this video up and running, when we can run it through our sound system, I'm going to show that video uh, of that area. But they talk about uh, meteors that can come in, come from outer space, from our, our solar system so fast that it can literally turn into liquid plasma is what they call it. This great heat that hits the ground and scorches everything and just instantly burns everything that's on the surface of, of the ground. Now, I can't say that, say the Lord on that, but, but these are the things that they're finding when it comes to these places. Because it says not only rain, but hailstones, fire, and brimstone as well. Boy, God can use anything at his fingertips to do what he wants. Amen? And the Bible says that, man, victory with the Lord doesn't depend on many or few. In fact, it doesn't depend on anyone. That's the whole point that he's trying to make. And Israel is going to sit back and see God take care of all. I mean, you think about the whole United States 
Canada, Alaska, Central America, South America, all coming against New Jersey, and then New Jersey, when it's all said and done, sitting at the top of the pile, king of the heap. Why? Because God's on the throne. Amen? And who is the, who is the defender of Israel, the Bible says? Now, we know who the great hater of Israel is, and that's Satan. Who's the, who's the greatest defender of Israel besides the Lord himself? The Bible tells us in Daniel who that is. What's his name? The defender of Israel. I'll give you a clue. He's an angel. Michael. Michael, the Bible is very crystal clear that he is the protector, the defender of Israel. He's the general of heaven. Boy. So when you look at the six-day war and how they got whooped that quick, remember that? How, how they, they got turned around, outgunned, outnumbered. You guys, you guys would probably remember that. I wasn't there for that. But boy, you think about, man, you, you, it was uh, the prophet Elijah and his, uh, his uh, partner that were being surrounded by the Assyrian army. Remember that? And he said to his, his servant, his servant said, well, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And then he looked at his servant and said, well, those that are with us outnumber those that are against us. Remember that? And he's like, what are you talking about? I'm looking at an army of people that are against us, and it's just me and you standing here. What do you mean we're the, we got more with us than they got with them? Well, then he prayed and said, Lord, open his eyes. And the Bible says he saw all those fiery chariots surrounding the mountains and the hillsides. Those fiery chariots were those angels. So I don't know how angels go to battle, but boy, they go to battle. And, I, you know, in my sanctified imagination, maybe an angel grabs somebody's arm for just a split second and allows the enemy, allows the, uh, the sword to hit the enemy. I mean, I, I don't know how they do it, but you can see that, man, angels are used in battle. You remember how David was praying? And he said, Lord, should I go or should I not go? And then what did the Lord say? When you hear the sound of marching, on top of the mulberry trees remember that and then when you hear the sound of marching stop that's when i want you to attack so it's as if god was getting all his angels in place for these battles and so the world doesn't have a clue how powerful a god he is and who they're messing with and the lord doesn't need an angel to do all this but he uses angels to do all these things so let's keep reading notice what it says it says and we'll, then we'll stop for uh verse 20 23 it says thus i will magnify myself and sanctify myself and i will be known in the eyes of many nations and they shall know that i am the lord you see that i will sanctify myself i will be known in the eyes of many nations and they shall know that i am the lord look at verse 39 or chapter 39 therefore thou son of man prophesy against gog and say thus saith the lord behold i'm against thee o gog the chief prince of meshech and tubal I will turn thee back and leave but the sixth part of thee, and I will cause thee to come up from the north parts, and I will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel, and I will smite thy bow out of thy left hand, and I will cause thy arrows to fall out of thy right hand, and thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel, thou and all thy band, and thy people that is with thee. And I will give thee unto the ravenous birds of every sort, and of the beasts of the field to be devoured. Thou shalt fall upon the open field, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. I will ascend a fire on Magog and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles. And they shall know that I am the Lord. So will I make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel. And I will not let them pollute my holy name anymore. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. This is how catastrophic this event's going to be. Look at verse 8. Behold, it is come, and it is done, saith the Lord God. This is the day whereof I have spoken. And they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth, and they shall set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shield and the bucklers, the bows and the arrows and the hand staves and the spears, and they shall burn them with fire for seven years. So in other words, the spoil is going to be so great that Israel... It's going to be able to burn and have fuel for seven years and not have to cut down one tree. Boy, isn't that amazing. And God is doing all of this himself. Guys, if this is happening, these pieces are on the table right now. Let's keep reading. Then it says this. Look at verse 23. And the heathen shall know that the house of Israel went into captivity for their iniquity. Yes, God scattered them. Remember how he used Nebuchadnezzar to do that? and Titus to do that because they trespassed against me therefore I hid my face from them and gave them into the hand of their enemies so they, they all 
fell by the sword. According to their uncleanness and according to their transgressions, I have done unto them and hid my face from them. Listen to this. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, now will I bring again the captivity of Jacob, Israel, and have mercy upon the whole house of Israel, and will be jealous for my holy name after that they have borne their shame and all their trespasses whereby they have trespassed against me when they have dwelt safely in their land and none made them afraid. When I have brought them again from the people and gathered them out of their enemy's land and am sanctified in their sight of many nations, then shall they know that I am the Lord their God, which caused them to be led into captivity among the heathen, but I have gathered them unto their own land and have left none of them any more there, neither will I hide my face any more from them, for I have poured out my spirit upon the house of Israel, saith the Lord. Boy. So, man, he wants Israel to be awake. He wants Israel paying attention when he comes back, and that's why Israel will be awakened so that they can look up and say, hey, that is the one that we pierced. We're going to mourn that. Why? Because, man, God's going to use this war to wake up the world and wake up Israel especially to show that, listen, what I say comes to pass. Pay attention. Amen? Boy, I don't know about you, but that puts a spring in my head. Now, it's not fun to talk about this stuff. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that. I'm not, I don't want to be morbid. But what I'm saying is, for the Christian point of view, man, it's exciting because God breathes hope into you, man. He breathes strength into you, man. You can see that it's coming. You can see that it's happening. So just like every word in that book has come to pass, all of it's going to come to pass. Amen? Amen. Are there any questions? Yes. This will be, this war right here, if, if it happens before the rapture, uh, that has nothing to do with fleeing to the mountains. But when the Antichrist goes into the temple and shows himself and declares himself to be God, that's when, that's when he says, hey man, boy, make sure you get out of Dodge quick. Don't go back to your house. Don't go get anything because the Antichrist is going to set it up to where he's going to swiftly uh, go in and start or start annihilating the Jews. And that's why the word of God says, pray that it's not winter. Pray that you're not pregnant. Pray that, you know, it's, it's not during that time because it's going to be difficult, difficult, difficult times. Boy, just like it was for the people of, of uh, the Jews during Nazi Germany, how difficult it was for them. And Nazi Germany is going to look like a Sunday picnic compared to what, man, the Antichrist is going to do when he gets into place, when he gets into power. Boy. So the problem with the world today is, though, the world is so used to Hollywood and $300 million movies they look at it like almost like it's science fiction. They're oh, yeah, 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 nothing impresses me, nothing moves me, but I'm telling you, God's going to show up, and he's going to impress everybody. So I pray that they're on the right side of the Lord. That's why we need to be about sharing the gospel, being in a church that preaches the gospel. Amen? Yes, ma'am. after the rapture right and the reason why you can't be saved after the rapture if you look at your bible is what did not the lord say no one can come unto me unless the father draws him did he not say that so does that mean does that mean that dave Unger could just wake up as a lost man and say yeah i decide to get saved today no you, you, you don't get saved unless god the father's what dealing with you and when he does deal with you and does draw you the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Repentance is always given in the immediate uh, present tense. Right now, immediately. Do it right now, this second. Yes, ma'am. Well, the Holy Spirit's going to still be here because he's God, right? Right. So the Holy Spirit's still going to be here, but he's going to let basically the Antichrist and his, 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 his crew, if you will, have free reign for seven years he's going to you know hold back his restraining power however the, the holy spirit being god is going to also be working on people who have not heard the gospel there's going to be you know the bible says man from every nation every kindred and every tribe every tongue these have come out of the great tribulation so there's going to be multitudes millions of people saved during the tribulation but it's going to be all those people that did not hear the gospel and had a chance to respond and repent The ones that are going to be martyred are the ones that refuse to get the mark of the beast on the right hand of their forehead. 
they'll be martyred. The ones that refuse that will be, will be martyred. The 144,000 virgins, those out of the 12 tribes of Israel, those will be supernaturally sealed and marked. And you can see where uh, they witnessed, but you can see where they all died, and they all ended up in heaven as well. And uh, were given robes, the Bible says. No, according to the Word of God. Why do I say that? Now, Tim LaHaye, he's a Tim LaHaye. I've got, I got his, his little work Bible. It's a great Bible. But the only thing I disagree with Tim LaHaye on is that, that point in his movies. These movies show the rapture takes place, and then all of a sudden the light bulb comes on with this group of people, and, boy, they, they start looking at Bible charts, and they start knowing what everything is doing. But if you look at 2 Thessalonians, as we read today, that group of people did what? They rejected the love of the truth that they might be saved. They took pleasure in unrighteousness that they all might be damned, the Bible says. Condemned. Why? Because they took pleasure in unrighteousness, rejected the gospel, the only thing that could save their soul. And for this cause, God sent that group of people strong delusion that they should believe the what? The lie. So if you reject J Jesus Christ and you fully have heard of the gospel, now who, Dave Unger doesn't know who fully heard the gospel. That's between them and God. But God knows who's heard the gospel. God knows who's heard it and who, who, who could really have repented and, and, and understood it. He knows that. That's his business. But the word of God teaches that, man, if you miss it, you will receive Antichrist. And God will see to it because he will send them strong delusion that they must believe the lie. And number two, here's the other reason. Let's just take that scripture out of the Bible and let's look at what he says. Today is the day of salvation, right? Does God promise anyone tomorrow? Does he promise you the next second? So if somebody says, hey, Lord, I know you're telling me to repent of my sin because I'm a rebellious, wicked person, and I know I need to, but, Lord, I'm going to take my chances after the rapture. So what, what is that person telling the Lord, in essence? Lord, I want a license to sin against you and rebel against you and continue to do it until I'm satisfied with whatever wild oats I want to sow. Then I'll pull you out of the freezer. Then you can come save me. It doesn't work that way at all because God says today is the day of salvation repent today he doesn't promise people tomorrow so that that teaching to say you have a second chance would be false just according to those scriptures are you with me and the Bible says that he's got to draw you so you don't pick the day you get saved you get saved when God is dealing with you yes ma'am Yeah, the Holy Spirit has to move. Spirit, You're done. Really Period. Period. Now, the Holy Spirit was drawing those people. He did convict them. He did say they needed to repent. They did have a chance. They... They, they partook in his ministry. Like he, Hebrews chapter 6, people think, you know, the Bible teaches you can lose your salvation in that chapter. You can't. It's talking about people that were Judaizers who were mixing good works with Christ, and, and they were getting it mixed up, and you can't get to heaven by it. So he was talking about that group of people that, that, that walked away, that, that, that had no fruit in their life because they were never saved to begin with at all. And so um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Anybody else have any other questions at all? Yeah. Yeah. No. Right. Well, I don't think it's going to be AI because. Here's why I don't believe the Antichrist is going to be AI. Because that's you're going to hear that. Oh, the Antichrist is going to be this artificial robot or, or something. Why is that not true? All right, I'll tell you why right now. Well, I'll tell you what. You tell me why. Answer the question. Why? How, how do I, How do you know for a fact that the Antichrist is not going to be a robot, but be a human being? Okay. Okay. All right. Any, anybody? Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. 
Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. Write it down, mark it down, highlight your Bible. Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. Let's see what it says. Revelation chapter 20. Let me get there, guy. Verse 10, I think it is, right? 20, verse 10. All right, here's what it says. Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. Here it is, guys. This is how we know that the Antichrist is not going to be a robot, all right? Or an AI device. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the what? Beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Robots don't go to hell. People do. People with a soul. People that have a soul either go to heaven or they go to hell. So we know that the Antichrist... Now, I think AI definitely will be in Satan's bag of tricks to deceive people. I think AI will certainly be used to do some of those things, but the, but the Antichrist himself would not be an artificial intelligence. He would be... Right, and plus Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 says, I'll put enmity between your seed, the woman's seed, and, and your seed. Remember that? But that verse right there proves that the Antichrist has a soul, that he's a human being, and that he's going to go to hell forever, unfortunately, for what he did and what he's doing. Any other questions? Any other questions at all? Listen to this. and Let me just close with this. Listen to this. Wow. Boy, listen to this. If I can, if I can read it right. Luke chapter 21. Listen to this. Man. And, those, and there shall be signs in the sun and moon and stars upon the earth and distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roar. Listen to this, guys. Now, listen, this, this, is how, this is how stressful these times are going to be in the future. And this is why, man, as God's people, we can have peace. But listen to what he says in, in Luke chapter 21, man, verse 26. Men's heart failing them for fear. When you look up that word failing, it means to, like, remove. Almost as if, like... They had a heart attack. They, they literally were so fearful that their heart stopped. Wow. Listen to what it says, guys, about this time, the tribulation that's coming. Men's heart failing them for fear, for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. Boy, they, they're, they're seeing it. They're sensing it. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, what things? All the things we just got done talking about, earthquakes and rumors of wars and all of those things, right? Listen to what Jesus says. Now, this is something that, I would, that God just taught me and showed me, and I've read this verse Lord knows how many times, and I missed it, but, but I want to teach it to you today. Listen to this. This is awesome. It says, and then shall, or, and then men's heart telling them, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Now, we've heard that verse before, right? But did you miss, did you see, did you see what was in that verse that I missed? Read it again, read it again. It says, and when these things begin to come to pass. It didn't say when these things come to pass. It says when these things what? begin to come to pass are these things beginning to come to pass yes they are he didn't say they had to completely come to pass he says when they begin to come to pass what does he say then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh and boy then he talks about the fig tree in israel becoming a nation so guys we're there man we're there boy honestly be honest now has this Bible study put a spring in your step? Boy, it does me. Man, it does. Boy, it just, and I know we've heard this, but it's good to wash over. It's good to be reminded and refreshed. Now, I personally believe that this event's going to take place before the rapture. Now, there's some people that think it might go into the tribulation, but the reason why I don't think it's going to go into the tribulation, this Ezekiel's war, is because it says it's going to take seven months to bury the dead, right? Seven months, all of Israel, to bury the dead. But then it says it takes seven years for them to use up all that fuel. Well, during the tribulation, no one's going to be worried about using probably anything. They're going to be probably more worried about hiding and looking for safety and dealing with all those other things that are going on in the chaos that's going to, that's going to hit this planet. So that's why I personally believe that this war is going to take place before the rapture takes place. Any questions? Yes.
They're a spirit. Yes, they're a spirit. Absolutely. Their personality, absolutely. A conscience. They have moral liability. All of those. An animal doesn't, but but an angel, a human being does. That's why we can be judged. Yes. Any other questions? Got so much to cover. Yes. Correct. AI is created by man. That's correct. And Satan and his angels were, were hell, hell was created for Satan and his angels, the Bible says. And then, of course, when man messed up, that's where man also goes as well. <laughs> I wish I could tell you, girl. I wish I could tell you. I'm doing the best I can to just try to give you my sanctified imagination. With I know, right, right, boy. But I, hey, I will say this: if you do see this happening, you see this right here, boy. I tell you what, you talk about, you talk about Jesus, man. The Bible says in Matthew that his hand is, you know, he, he's right at the door. Well, I, I can just see this thing is just about to touch that doorknob, boy. Especially if you see this going on. Amen. All right. So next Wednesday. What we're going to stick to is the timeline. We'll stick to that, all right? So we'll go from Genesis all the way to Revelation with, with prophecy, okay? We'll look at the major events that take place, some of the things that are coming up. And then but what I'm going to do is I'm going to have probably a, a blank screen, and I'm going to say, all right, you tell me what's next, and then I'm going to show you what, what's next, the rapture. What, what happens after the rapture? What happens after that? What happens after that? So put your thinking caps on. And come with some of those answers so that you guys will get good handles on, on the timeline of prophecy. <laughs> yes. Well, I, I, feel, I feel like I do all the talking here, and I, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. Uh, are you guys enjoying this? Yes. I, I, and I know that's a loaded question. I'm not fishing. I'm not. I just, I, I just my, my desire is that you guys really get it. That you, because a lot of this is not being taught, in, in, unfortunately, in a lot of churches. It is being taught in some, yes, praise God. But in a lot of places, it's not. And we need to know these things. Why? Because, man, over almost a third of the Bible is Bible prophecy. Boy, yes, ma'am. I'm glad you're going over it again because it's a lot to digest one time. Oh, good. Well, so, that, so you, you guys are, don't mind me going over it again? I just don't want to bore you. I don't. Because there's a lot to cover. Amen? All right, one, one last question we're going to dismiss. How many temples are there? I've, I've, asked this, I've asked this three times. How many temples are there total? Five. Five. All right. Besides Lynn, because I know she knows. What, they, they, somebody help me out now. What's the first temple? Well, you had, you had the tabernacle, right? We're not going to count that. But the first one was Solomon. What was the second one? Well, in the New Testament, it's known as what? Herod's temple, but remember Zerubbabel and all those guys, Haggai, God stirred them up and they rebuilt that temple in the Old Testament and then Herod came and added to it and did all that stuff, well it's known as Herod's temple so you got, you got Solomon's temple you got the Herod's temple, that's the gospel temple, right, you got the Old Testament temple, the gospel temple and then what's the third temple what's the third one we're waiting on it right now to be built it's the tribulation temple, right? Second Thessalonians, the Antichrist has to have a temple in order to walk in there, right? To show himself to be God, right? So you got, you got Solomon's temple, Herod's temple. You got the tribulation temple. All right, what's the fourth temple? We talked about that last Wednesday. It's going to be 50 uh, miles square, right? The outer court's going to be 50 miles square. The temple itself, during what period is going to be what? How big is it going to be? The Millennial Temple. That's the fourth temple, right? The Millennial Temple, right? It's going to be a mile square. The temple itself is going to be a mile square. Man, when you go out there and see that Amazon building out there, how big is that? Is that building a, is that building a mile square? I don't think it is. But it's huge. Have you seen it? Have you seen that building, the Amazon building that's down the road? Man, it's huge. And yet, that's going to look small compared to the Millennial Temple. All right, then there's one more temple. What's the fifth temple? Yes, the new Jerusalem that comes down out of heaven. So the five temples, yes, you guys are getting it, learning. 
And what four things happen to people that miss the rapture? First one's going to be they're going to be what? Deserted, right? Because we're going to be left behind. The second thing that's going to happen because they rejected the truth is what? Deceived. And then if they make it through all the, the, the trumpet and the bowl of judgments and all those judgments, they'll be, number three, destroyed. And then number four, because they took pleasure in unrighteousness and received not the love of the truth, that they all might be what? Damned. The four Ds. Boy, deserted, deceived, destroyed, and damned. That's why the gospel is so important. That's why we need to be about the gospel, preaching the gospel. That's why we harp on outreach all the time. That's a bell that needs to be rung all the time because a lot of people get scared when it comes to outreach, right? But we don't need to be scared. But we need to honestly be excited. These are exciting times for the Christian as far as peace and seeing God's word come together. But at the same time, it's, 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 it's a time that should motivate us to get busy with the gospel. Amen? All right. Any other questions? Now, I, I just feel like I'm keeping people here, and I, I don't want to do that. Any, any other questions? I'll say as long as you want me to. That's fine with me, but I just want to make sure you guys are good. All right. I'm going to ask George to close this in prayer.